Hi everybody. Uh, my part today is grace for all, but before we begin, I just want to show you this uh, wonderful place. It's a it's a very ancient uh, olive trees grove. As you can see, uh, we know for sure that these trees are at least thousand. the monastery after uh, Johanna. And as you can see, the trees are extremely old and very impressive. Some of them are younger, of course, but this one and the other big ones are uh, very old. We have a Galilean good wind. So, as we said, grace for all. And what does uh, 6 6 has to do with the Pentecost? Okay, in Hosea uh, 6 6, we read, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. The original Hebrew biblical term is chesed. Chesed means grace. That is, mercy is part of chesed and knowing God. Hosea 6.6 6 is clear. Chesed precedes all. How did Yeshua understand this principle? In Matt Matt 12 reports two incidences. The first is in verses 1 to 8. Here the disciples speak and eat grains on Shabbat. The second is verses 9-13. Here Yeshua heals a man on Shabbat. The Pharisees accused Yeshua disciples of uh, violating Shabbat by plucking grains. Yeshua defended them by a threefold argument. 1. Fasting on Shabbat is not permitted. 2. Saving life precedes Shabbat. 3. The general principle of chesed, grace, also supersedes Shabbat. But there is another point in Mark 3, 1, 6. I quote, Another time Jesus, Yeshua, went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Yeshua, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Shabbat. Yeshua said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Yeshua asked them, Which is lawful on Shabbat, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how, how they might kill Yeshua. Yeshua did nothing, did nothing except for instructing, instructing the man stretch out your hand. He spoke to the man, and speaking is allowed on Shabbat. Healing by speech is, then, not violating Shabbat. Not only is that healing on Shabbat not forbidden, for the reasons mentioned before, Yeshua explains in Matt 12, 8 and Luke 6, 5, and almost identical in Mark 2, 27, 28. These verses read, And he said to them, Shabbat was created for humankind, and not humankind for Shabbat. Hence mankind is mastering Shabbat as well. Amazingly, a fourth generation Tana said the same, almost word by word, as the Mechilta de Rabbi Ishmael, Parasha Kitisa Masechta de Shabbat 1 reads. I translate, And you shall keep Shabbat. Rabbi Shimon ben Menasya used to say 
Shabbat is given to you and you are not given to Shabbat. And of course, Yeshua preceded Rabbi Shimon ben Menasseh by decades. Rabbi Shimon ben Menasseh was probably a, Gar a Galilean and here he agrees with Yeshua. It should be noted, in this source, no rabbinic objection occurs. Shabbat is, therefore, the expression among others, one expression among others of God's grace. Avoiding healing on Shabbat means violating God's grace. In a way, not healing on Shabbat is violating Shabbat. Yeshua healed the centurion slave with no reservations. What triggered him was the centurion's faith. Whether it was Shabbat or not, it makes no difference. This is grace. However, when the woman from Tyre asked him to heal her daughter, he replied, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Chronologically, the centurion's event preceded the Tyre event. Yeshua's declaration, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel, explains all, the, all his deeds, but he did not refuse to heal the centurion's slave, although the officer and his slave were Gentiles, while, in complete contrast, he initially refused to heal the Gentile woman's daughter. What is the difference between these cases? In Matt 15, 23, we read, Yeshua did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and, and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. To this, Yeshua replied, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Then the woman begged him, Lord, please heal my daughter. <clears throat> Yeshua replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. This reply is in line with the former. I was sent only to, for the lost sheep of Israel. However, it seems to ignore the term <coughs> the woman used to address Yeshua, Lord. Then the woman stressed her humbleness by, Yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Just a second. It was probably the moment Yeshua understood what is behind the woman's request. She addresses a Jewish healer by the term Lord and accepts his comparisons of Gentiles with God, with dogs. A Gentile must have great faith to term a Jew Lord and accept the comparison with dogs. It is also possible that in the case of the centurion, Yeshua considered another factor. A Roman officer, as a Roman officer, the centurion could be harsh to Jews in Kafarnahum and its vicinity. Pleasing him would secure the safety and welfare of the neighboring Jews. It could be the reason that Yeshua met him and listened in the first place. It allowed Yeshua to understand the officer's faith, keeping peaceful coexistence with the Gentiles is well rooted in, in rabbinic ideas. As the Mishnah Gitin 5.8 testifies, Rabbi Yosei says, We do not prevent poor Gentiles from collecting leket, shichicha and pe'ah, the leftovers in a cornfield after harvesting, for the reason of peaceful conduct. A broader list occurs in the Jer Jerusalem Tal Talmud, Avodah Zarah 1.3, 39c. One way or another, the idea of being graceful to Gentiles is well known in rabbinic sources. <clears throat> it is termed darchei shalom, which means peaceful ways or conduct. It means be graceful to Gentiles to secure Jewish lives and welfare. It could have been the case with the centurion as well. However, the case with the woman from Tyre is different. It shows pure unconditional grace to Gentiles, precisely what God's grace is, universal. How all this is connected to the Pentecost? In Acts 2, we read about the first Pentecost after the crucifixion. 
this this description uses among other sources Joel it is a relatively short chapter when we read parts of the first and last verses of this chapter we understand what Pentecost has to do with universal grace I quote in the last days God says I will pour out my spirit on all people and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God's Spirit on all people. Each one who calls God's Spirit will be saved. No one specifically. All are entitled to enjoy God's Spirit and salvation, provided that they all have faith in God and call on His Spirit. This takes us back to the centurion and the gentile woman from Tyre. The decisive factor is not being a Jew, but having faith in God and His grace. And one last sentence to conclude. Said the Lord, Beiti Beit Fila Yel Hola Amin. My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. There is no grace more than this sort of grace. And this connects us back to the Pentecost. Thank you.